there, welcome back to another Toothpickings. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian, I like to toothpick, and this year is a very special anniversary. It is a centenary, centenary? It's been a hundred years since an important film was released. What is special about a movie wherein a young woman visits her father in an insane asylum where she falls asleep and has a fever dream about a non-consensual wedding to her high school music teacher? Would you believe it's the first movie to have Dracula as a character? I mean, honestly, would you? Because the jury's still kind of out on whether that's really what happened. Let's discuss. Dracula, soul on fire. He's blood, cool as ice. It's a little tricky because there is nobody living who has seen this movie. It is unfortunately one in many lost films that uh, we have discussed here on this program or on the pages of the blog. There's something about vampire movies and old horror movies that just seem to lend themselves to disappearing into the ether like an invisible man. That's a good segue, right? The thing is, before 1931, before Universal Pictures made that first Dracula picture, not everybody pictured Dracula is having, you know, a tuxedo and a cape and a widow's peak, which is really a good look. I think we'll all agree. Before that, people still had an idea in their head of what Dracula was and who he was. They had this image of a bloodthirsty nobleman who preyed on people around him. Just kind of like if, even though you didn't see Fifty Shades of Grey, you dirty liar, I know you did, you still have this kind of picture of who Christian Grey is, right? Okay, good, we're on the same page, let's continue. And so, inserting an antagonist that people had this kind of passing familiarity with was probably a good move if you were trying to make a low-budget horror movie in Hungary in the 1920s. And that's kind of what happened. I'm saying words like kinda and maybe and probably because we don't have the film. We don't know exactly how it all went down. What we do have is some clues in the form of a script that was uncovered by, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, Jano Farkas in 1997. Uh, Farkas summarized the story of the film in a paper, but let's lay out the broad strokes here. Mary, of course her name is Mary, goes to visit her father in a mental hospital. She sees her old music teacher who thinks of himself as Dracula, and that's Dracula with a K here. The inmates abduct her, and uh, they are intent on in performing some kind of horrible experiment on her eyeballs. Mary escapes. She flees. And then um, she does something that I would not have expected. She chooses to spend the night in that asylum, because that's what you do after you escape an abduction, which people try to remove your eyes and do horrible experiments on. That's a good look, right? Good look. That's a good pun. <laughs> All right, you like what I did there. While she's asleep in the asylum, she has a dream about her former music teacher. And in the dream, he abducts her, takes her to a castle, tries to force her to marry him. Um, it is important to note that in the dream, he is not imagining himself to be Dracula. In the dream, he is Dracula, okay? Important point. We will circle back to that in a moment. The marriage is thwarted by a cross, as so many are. She flees to a nearby village where Dracula pursues her and uh, mesmerizes her with, you know, his hypnotic stare. A doctor appears. I don't know if he had existed in the film prior to this, but he just magically comes about when he's needed to free Mary of her hypnosis. They light the uh, village on fire, or perhaps it's the castle on fire. I'm not really clear on that. And then Mary does what she does best, which is to flee. Fleeing is kind of her thing, you see. How does she survive another pursuit by Dracula? Well... She does a pre-Hollywood Dorothy and wakes up from the dream. It was all a dream, or was it? No, it was a dream. In the waking world, her old music teacher decides to prove his immortality by challenging another inmate to shoot him in the heart. And that goes about as well as you would imagine, which is to say he dies very quickly. There may or may not be a post-death scene musical a la Hamilton, but that is the end of the movie. Clearly, this is not an adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel. That's not the point. The point is, is Dracula a character in this movie? 
Here's my argument. During the waking moments in the movie where you have a music teacher who imagines himself to be Dracula, no, you don't have Dracula in the movie. Uh, any more than if you had a uh, character who believed that they were Napoleon doesn't equal you having Napoleon in your movie. But during the dream scene, he is represented as being Dracula, the character Dracula. He's got a castle. He's got a, a, a mesmeric stare. He has demon wives. He can even do that Saruman thing where he speaks to you and you have to obey his commands. He's Dracula in the dream. Now, if you want to argue to me that, well, that happens in the dream diegesis of the film, therefore Dracula is not in the film, then you also have to argue that there is no witch in The Wizard of Oz because the witch only exists within the dream and also you're probably very boring at parties and I don't want to hang out with you. When the film premiered in February of 1921, which is a full year before Nosferatu premiered, a lot of moviegoers would have been sold on the name Dracula right there in the title. There's a reason they didn't name it Mary and Her Crazy Dream. They named it Dracula's Death because Dracula was the character they wanted to pull people in with. They were representing this film as having Dracula in it. And I would say they delivered. But it's still hard to rule on because the film is lost. Between 1912 and 1930, there were something like 600 Hungarian films made. Only 45 are still with us. That's one twelfth of the films made during this period survived. The rest are all lost, probably forever. And so unless there's someone who's like 110 years old in Hungary who got taken to this movie when they were very young and they have very strong trust issues, we don't know anyone who has seen it. So until either the movie surfaces in some janitor's closet or someone very, very old with a very good memory of movies they saw when they were young comes forward, we're just going to have to go with what scholars like Lockie Heiss and Jeno Farkas have come up with. It kind of adds to the mystery in a way. It is perhaps poetic that Dracula's first line in this film was supposedly, and I quote, I don't remember, I don't remember anything. I am Dracula, the immortal. Echoing that title character's prescient opening line, Dracula Halala is both forgotten and immortal. It's lost to us, but it has scored a place in history that can never be taken away from it because it was the first use of the world's most famous gothic character. And that is this week's Toothpickings. But it wasn't a dream. It was a place. And you, and you, and you... And you were there. Everything I've said in this video, plus more information, is available in blog form. I originally made this story as a printed blog on Medium. You can follow that link below. And if you go to that, you'll also be able to follow some of the links embedded in the blog. Like, for instance, if you want to read Geno Farkas's treatment of the script version of Dracula Halala, you can do that by going to the blog. Hope you enjoy. Thank you.